what a fantastic presentation and uh, you know session we've had uh, from the team just before us. Some truly inspiring stories and um, some great inspiration for all of us moving forward. Um, at this point, we'd like to move on to the next session of the afternoon. Um, and it's my great honor to introduce the next speaker, who is Andrew Ferber, OBE. Um, so Andrew has been Regional Director for Public Health England and Regional Director for the Northwest uh, since May 2020. Uh, he was previously Centre Director for Public Health England in Yorkshire and Humber. Humber. He originally trained as a GP and uh, is now a public health specialist with international experience. He's worked for seven years in Nepal at all levels of the health system over there, working on some short and long term projects over there. Um, and in the UK, he's worked as a public health director uh, from 2007 all the way up to 2018. And he's previously been president of the Association of Directors of Public Health. So truly a well accomplished man. Really, really fantastic. Uh, Andrew was is so well accomplished, actually, that he was awarded an OBE in May 2022. Um, so it's once again, it's my great honor to have him here today and, and have him on the program speaking. Um, as a public health trainee myself, Andrew is not only an inspiration, but it's also my boss's boss's boss. So he's a true role model, and um, I hope to one day be able to achieve some of the things that he's achieved in his career and uh, use him as the foundation for, to, to follow moving forward. Uh, today, Andrew is here to talk to us about his journey through public health, the role public health plays in modern times, how people just like yourself can make a difference, and some of the career opportunities available to, to all of you sitting at home. Without any further ado, uh, please welcome Andrew onto the stage. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here today. So how's it going, Andrew? And uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, no, I'm good, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to the weekend. It's been a busy week. Uh, it feels like autumn's arrived in the north of England. Still looking forward to getting out and about in the weather. That's definitely, definitely, definitely correct. Um, the weather has not been beautiful where we are at the moment, but hopefully it doesn't last too much longer. We're very excited to hear you speak today, uh, and I'm sure all those at home have been uh, waiting eagerly for this session. So whenever you're ready, feel welcome to take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Yaz. Uh, can I just start by saying uh, I really appreciate being invited to uh, this event today. I, th I think it's just fabulous uh, what you're doing. Uh, we need to do so much more to improve uh, access to medicine and other healthcare professional, uh, the healthcare professions, uh, to ensure that uh, those coming into the profession better reflect the communities uh, that we serve. Uh, you know, there are far too many uh, underrepresented groups that are not represented in, in medicine and other uh, healthcare professions. So I just love what uh, this conference is doing and what. Uh, work is going on more broadly to try and uh, improve access. And if you're kind of listening in today and just kind of wondering whether you've uh, got what it takes, if you if you feel passionate about a career in medicine or a healthcare profession, uh, you know, then my advice to you is to go for it, follow your heart. Uh, and if you've got the, the passion and you're prepared to work hard, uh, you will make it. But uh, Following Yaz's very kind introduction, I do just want to talk a little bit about um, public health uh, and in particular how you uh, can make a difference to a fairer, more equal uh, and healthier world. Um, I hope at the end of this, a better understanding of what public health is uh, and an understanding of public health careers. And if you don't think a public health career is for you, uh, how you can make a difference um, to see a fairer, more equal and healthier world uh, in whatever part of the uh, healthcare system uh, you end up in. But I wanted to start just by telling you a little bit about my story and my uh, journey. So I went to Newcastle Medical School and was there for five years. To be honest, I, I'm not really quite sure I knew what I was letting myself in for. Uh, I was kind of Good at sciencey things at school. Uh, I wanted to do a degree that was kind of more vocational than uh, than theoretical, and uh, I had the grades for medical school, so I kind of went for it. It's kind of not the motivation I would recommend, or probably not the motivation that would get you in uh, these days. But 
it's what got me to Newcastle. And uh, through my five years there, I, I kind of really enjoyed everything and uh, all, all the specialties that I passed through. So at the end, I decided uh, to do general practice because I felt that that kind of gave me a little bit of everything. I could do some pediatrics and uh, long-term condition management, dermatology, uh, obstetrics. You could do a little bit of everything. So, uh, so that's uh, what I started to do. But I did have a hankering uh, to do something different while I was still young and still able. Uh, so at the end, or actually in the middle of my uh, GP training uh, program, I took six months to go and work uh, in Nepal. And the picture you can see at the top right of the screen is uh, actually Mount Everest. The peak at the top there in the middle uh, is Mount Everest. And uh, I spent six months in Okaldunga district, which is uh, the district to the south of Solukumbu district, which is where Mount Everest is. And I was there at a, a district hospital uh, covering between one long-term doctor leaving and the next uh, long-term doctor arriving. Uh, and it, it was a real uh, life-changing uh, six months, a real career-changing uh, six months for me. And I want to tell you about one uh, individual in particular uh, who I met there. It was a young lad called uh, Sham. Uh, must have been 10, 11 years old. Uh, and even though I was a relatively junior doctor, as soon as he walked into the clinic, uh, I could see immediately he had uh, what we call pot spine. So this is a a deformity of the spine that's very often caused by tuberculosis. And we got the test done and uh, confirmed that tuberculosis was the likely uh, treatment. Uh, now, the, the treatment for uh, tuberculosis that we were using at the time uh, involved an injection and some tablets. And we would normally teach the family how to give the injection and uh, instruct them on how to give the tablets and send them uh, back home to continue uh, the treatment. Uh, if patients needed admitting to hospital, there were costs involved, patients had to pay for, you know, contribution at least towards uh, some of the food, for example. It's not like the NHS where uh, everything is, is free at the point of need. Um, in situations like Nepal, these things have to be paid for in some way. So people usually prefer to go home and take the treatment at home. But anyway, this lad's father was absolutely insistent that he was admitted, uh, absolutely refused to take him home. And so after some discussion, we agreed to admit him. And he was with us for about a month. And during that month, uh, we got to know more about his story. And it turns out that this lad came from a village about uh, two days walk away uh, from the hospital. There were no uh, motorable roads in the time uh, in the district. Uh, people just had to walk to the hospital if they wanted to come, no ambulances, people had to be carried. Uh, so he'd been carried for the two days uh, to get to the hospital. And it turned out his village was a, a very small one, uh, just consisting of three households, uh, the father of this boy and his uh, two brothers, so his two uncles, if you like. Uh, and the father told us that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, one by one, uh, members of this small village uh, were succumbing to a, a disease that was characterized by uh, a cough, a chronic cough, uh, night sweats, uh, losing weight, uh, and one by one, unfortunately, uh, these villagers were dying. Now, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, with, with medicine, uh, but uh, th those, at least with a bit of training, would recognize those as the very classical symptoms of uh, tuberculosis. Uh, but they didn't know what was going on, that they consulted the uh, local uh, healer, uh, the, the Dami Jankri, uh, as it would be called in, in Nepali, uh, and asked uh, for his advice. And he kind of went through the rituals and uh, sacrifices and what have you, and uh, clearly uh, those things uh, didn't work. Uh, now, I want to make it clear I'm not dismissing the role of uh, traditional healers. And uh, in, in another role uh, in Nepal, I spent a bit of time uh, training and working with these uh, people because they are the eyes and ears out in the villages and are well placed to spot signs of uh, serious illness. Uh, but on this occasion, he didn't recognize that this was a serious illness that uh, required treatment. Uh, and in fact, when this um, little boy became ill, uh, he told the father, if you 
uh, take the boy to hospital, uh, he will surely die. But the lad's father thought, well, the rest of my family have died, my wife's died, and my brothers have died, I've got nothing to lose. So he took him to hospital, uh, we diagnosed him uh, with TB uh, and started upon treatment and he, and he responded very well. Uh, but the village was not only remote, uh, there were not only no other health services there, uh, the family were subsistence farmers, so very, very poor, just relying on uh, what they could grow uh, within the land that they had available, uh, that they were I illiterate, uh, so they couldn't uh, kind of read and write, so even if there were, was sort of health uh, information around, they couldn't have uh, accessed it very easily. So. I reflected on this and kind of had a light bulb moment that although tuberculosis had been the immediate cause of this lad's predicament, uh, there were some causes of that cause uh, and it was the uh, inaccessibility of the village, it was the remoteness of health services, it was the fact that uh, the family were illiterate, uh, that they were uh, living pretty much near the poverty line. They didn't have the resources in order to uh, access the uh, help that they needed. So that made me think that, you know, these things are really important in terms of uh, health and well-being, really important in terms of improving the health of communities. So I finished uh, my six months there and came back uh, to uh, work in Newcastle. And I was just kind of reminded by that experience of uh, an, another woman that I'd seen in uh, working in Newcastle, actually when I was a, a house officer at Newcastle General Hospital, which was known at the time as the workhouse, because it was uh, previously a workhouse in Victorian times. Uh, very modernised now and uh, quite different to how it was then, but it still had that kind of Victorian feel. And I remember looking after this woman uh, called Margaret, and she was in her 60s, uh, and she had end-stage chronic obstructive lung disease. Uh, and I was called to see her in the middle of the night and uh, just sat with her and held her hand as she literally uh, breathed her last. Now, a 60-year-old is not old uh, and certainly not an age who should be uh, dying of uh, chronic lung disease. Uh, but this had been caused by the fact that Margaret had been uh, a smoker for more than 40 years. Uh, but again, as I, I kind of thought about Margaret's story, she hadn't come from um, the well-to-do part of Newcastle. She came from the west end of Newcastle, the poorer part. She hadn't completed education at school. She didn't have a good job. And she came from a society where smoking was the norm. Uh, in her community, uh, the majority of adults uh, would have been smokers when uh, she started smoking. So again, that kind of realization that uh, prevention was much better than cure, but prevention required us to address some of those determinants of, uh, in this case, smoking behavior, those determinants uh, of ill health. So that's what uh, got me uh, into public health, those kind of two light bulb experiences where you realize that there's only so much you can do by providing uh, treatment, uh, particularly towards the end stage of a disease process and, and how much better it is to uh, act early uh, and prevent illness from happening in the first place. But in order to do that, we need to uh, influence the conditions in which people live. So public health then is defined as that science and art of uh, preventing disease, uh, prolonging life and promoting uh, health and well-being uh, through the organized efforts of society. Uh, but there is a science to it. There is an evidence base, a robust evidence base uh, around the interventions that we uh, try to put in place. But because it does require the organized efforts of society, there's an art to it as well. There's a, a kind of a leadership that's required uh, if we're to make these things happen and to make a difference. It is a very broad agenda. That's one of the things I, I love about it. You can be dealing with uh, everything from tobacco to transport, children's health to climate change, uh, violence to viruses, uh, pretty much anything which directly and indirectly uh, impacts on people's health and well-being. Viruses, of course, uh, in the news over the last uh, two, three years when we've been uh, dealing with uh, the COVID response, and we can uh, talk a bit more about that later if uh, people are interested in uh, hearing more about that. But a simple way to think about it is that uh, clinical invention, interventions 
um, really relate to uh, individuals. It's if you give somebody treatment for um, high blood pressure, for example, or, or diabetes, that's an individual level clinical intervention. Public health interventions can be thought about things which apply to uh, populations, to groups of people rather than uh, individuals. So that's public health, but I think it's uh, really important that I just uh, spend a few moments focusing on uh, health inequalities, uh, because we know that um, everybody does not enjoy the same uh, level of health. There are these unfair and avoidable differences in people's health across the population and between uh, specific groups. Now, I've just put a few uh, figures down here. There's lots more that I could have put up there, but they are sobering, um, I would suggest. So if you are homeless and uh, living on the street, your life expectancy is roughly half uh, what it would be for somebody um, that, that's uh, in, in a housing situation. Uh, so, you know, I think that's uh, that's quite shocking. If you live in uh, one of the more uh, de uh, deprived areas, so I cover the Northwest, if you're a woman in uh, Blackpool, uh, your healthy life expectancy is just barely 50 years. So you, you don't even reach retirement age before you start uh, developing uh, ill health and conditions which affect your uh, life expectancy. In the most affluent parts of the country, uh, that is 70 years. So a 20 year difference in healthy life expectancy, depending on where you live. Uh, asylum seekers, similarly, um, poor health, um, those coming from uh, certain uh, ethnic groups similarly suffer poor health. Uh, back to COVID again, COVID deaths uh, in black men um, were uh, considerably higher than those in white men during the first wave of uh, COVID-19 and understanding those differences really important in terms of uh, the response. And those with uh, serious mental illness, 390% uh, excess mortality um, uh, compared to the average. So, you know, really quite stark differences uh, in people's health that it is important that we understand because that then will need to guide the interventions that we uh, put in place. Now, there's a, there's a bigger picture to all this, uh, of course. So I, I, I felt it would be remiss if I didn't uh, pick up on this um, because I think this is, this is really topical and, and going to be really important in terms of your careers uh, wherever uh, you end up. Uh, so th this is a graphic just to try and explain that. So the smallest box there, uh, perhaps represents uh, individual uh, clinical uh, interventions. Uh, the next circle out is public health, so that's at community level, population level, that's what I've uh, just been trying to explain. Global health could be thought about uh, those public health uh, interventions uh, in an international context where people face uh, perhaps different barriers to achieving uh, good health. One Health can be thought about as uh, not only human health, but also animal health and the sort of biosystem uh, in which we live. Uh, and we know that increasingly we're seeing uh, viruses uh, that uh, are hosted within pigs or chickens or whatever, um, and uh, find some way of um, transferring to humans. And every now and again, one of those viruses will be able to uh, replicate within humans be transmitted between humans uh, and cause uh, severe disease. And that's uh, inevitably going to happen. So we will see another uh, pandemic that takes that kind of route at some point. At the moment, none of us know quite where or how or when, uh, but it will come uh, at some point. So important that we understand that kind of One Health uh, dynamic, not just thinking about human health, but also thinking about animal health. And then the biggest circle, of course, is, is planetary health, thinking about the environment uh, in which we live and uh, climate change. Uh, the figures today have been produced uh, on the excess deaths that we saw during the heat wave in the summer, uh, nearly 3,000 uh, people over the age of 65 um, died um, unexpectedly above what we would have expected uh, during the summer because of that uh, hot weather. 
Uh, this winter, we will every winter we see uh, excess mortality related to the cold weather, uh, and this winter in particular, when people are worried about the cost of living and the cost of fuel and whether they can heat their houses, you know, the real concern that we might see uh, excess mortality uh, associated with that. So really important that uh, as public health people, uh, we think about uh, planetary health and the changes to our climate. Now, I'll talk in a minute about uh, specialist uh, public health training and specialist public health roles. Uh, but public health, I think, is something that every healthcare worker uh, should be doing. Uh, really important that everybody, I think, has an understanding of public health because uh, there aren't many public health specialists, frankly, and uh, you know we cannot do everything. We need uh, everybody contributing to making that fairer, equal, and healthier world. So maybe things about health protection that you can do. Uh, encouraging people to get uh, immunized, for example, or practicing good hygiene, infection control measures to limit the spread of infection. There might be things that you can do to prevent uh, illness from happening, falls prevention, public access defibrillators, uh, being competent in basic uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Just some examples there, or promoting uh, good health. Uh, promoting healthy behaviours, uh, thinking about the uh, well-being of your team and your, your staff, uh, making every, every contact count is a specific programme which trains uh, healthcare workers and in fact anybody coming into contact with members of the public to know how to go about having conversations around um, alcohol consumption, for example, or uh, stopping smoking. Uh, running health campaigns or um, uh, advising people on uh, how they might uh, stop smoking. Uh, something that everybody can do. You don't need to be trained in public health to do these things. There is the potential to do more though, and we need to make sure that uh, our uh, workforce uh, in the NHS and the care system uh, kind of understand the potential that they have uh, to make these sort of interventions in uh, the lives of their uh, clients and residents and patients. Uh, but public health careers then, um, this is my final slide and so it's a slightly fuzzy so I'll just uh, kind of talk through it uh, a little bit. So the inner circle there just talks about public health careers and four domains in which people uh, commonly work. So at the bottom there there's the academic public health uh, so you can uh, train uh, up through um, various fellowships and uh, get uh, the, the kind of research degrees that are required, the PhDs uh, that are required uh, for a career in academic public health. And that's a, a really important role in terms of generating some of that evidence, some of that science that I spoke about earlier that then informs uh, our public health practice. So there's academic public health roles. Um, in the yellow there, there's health protection roles. Uh, now in England, uh, health protection is delivered by the UK Health Security Agency, which is a new agency specifically devoted to uh, delivering on uh, the health protection function, uh, which is uh, around communicable disease control uh, principally, but also looking at uh, environmental hazards uh, and making sure that the, the population is uh, safe uh, from that. At the top um, kind of orangey block there is around uh, health improvement and I'm uh, now employed by the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities within uh, the Department of Health and Social Care which is taking forward uh, that health improvement uh, agenda supporting people to uh, be smoke free, to uh, understand better their alcohol consumption, how to be more physically active, how to eat more healthily uh, and so on. And then finally, healthcare public health. So I also uh, have a joint role with um, NHS England uh, in the Northwest, and I have a team uh, within NHS England in the Northwest uh, that looks at uh, effective uh, public health services, screening and immunization services are within uh, the NHS uh, in England, and uh, dental public health uh, is also one of the functions. So we advise uh, the NHS on um, the evidence around effective uh, and efficient uh, interventions, 
Uh, I, I'm the senior responsible officer in the Northwest for our inequalities program within the NHS, which includes the role of uh, the NHS organizations as anchor institutions. So these are, you know, NHS hospitals, as you will understand, are big employers uh, within the local area. And uh, if they're recruiting from the local population in a, an equitable way, that's a real contribution uh, to improving health in the long term. If they're procuring um, services from local uh, providers that are paying a, a fair wage, again, that's another way in which they can contribute. The inequalities, I'm also the responsible officer for their prevention work uh, and also for their work around the greener NHS, so helping uh, the NHS to become um, more, more or less carbon uh, admitting to, to reach net zero um, in, in line with the ambitions that the NHS have. So those are the kind of four domains uh, in which people can work. Now, if you're uh, in England and working within the local authority team, uh, which is where directors of public health uh, are appointed, you'll probably uh, be covering three, if not four of those uh, roles that you will uh, have a health protection uh, remit. So you'll be doing things around improving health. You'll be liaising with the uh, NHS locally, as well as very probably with your local uh, academic public health department. Now, within those domains, you can uh, kind of choose where you want to work. So uh, the purple line on that kind of rainbow there is around the life course. So some people choose to do uh, health improvement roles that focus on children and young people in those kind of early years. Uh, other people choose um, healthcare, public health roles that focus on uh, perhaps older people and, and aging healthily. So, uh, so within each of those domains, there's a possibility to uh, kind of think about particular segments of the population. And then on the outside, again, there's those kind of determinants of health. So uh, from the left, genetics there. So there is a, a kind of subspecialty of public health genetics, just trying to understand how uh, genetics affects the uh, health of the population, uh, access to healthcare, healthy and sustainable places, health behaviors, uh, and social and economic factors. So, so a public health career uh, offers the opportunity to uh, work on those kind of issues, uh, all with the aim of improving uh, public health, the health of the population. Now, I've put some links there, uh, which I'm more than happy for these slides to be shared. You can click on the links and go through to those uh, sites for further information. But actually, if you just go and look on the Faculty of Public Health website, uh, they have a tab on careers in public health and a lot of detail there on how you can uh, get into uh, public health careers. Uh, if you think that specialty training is for you, and by specialty training, I mean that um, after you've done your foundation training, uh, you can um, train as a specialist in public health in the way that uh, others might train as a pediatrician or a a surgeon, it's the same five year, uh, you know, quite rigorous uh, training uh, program with uh, postgraduate exams and so on. Public health specialty training differs from uh, those other medical specialties, though, by being open to um, people that come th th up through other routes. And this is one of the things I love about uh, public health. You get to work with people uh, that come from other disciplines. So. You may have come up through a, a nursing route, allied health professional, other uh, kind of healthcare route, uh, or you may have come up through a completely different route, so maybe uh, been a geographer or a, a statistician or a, um, a journalist even, you, you know, uh, and all these skills really contribute because if you're a statistician, you know, that really helps to understand the data and uh, the intelligence. If you're a journalist that gives you great skills around how to communicate better uh, with the population. So it's that, that richness of uh, those that work in public health that I, I really enjoy. But more information on uh, specialty training through the faculty website. It is uh, very competitive. Uh, there are about 10 applications for uh, every place. Um, and that uh, makes it one of the most competitive of the uh, postgraduate specialty uh, training programs. I think things like cardiothoracic surgery and neurosurgery might uh, have a higher ratio, but that's because they have very few uh, places. 
Uh, but as I said before, you know, if, if you're passionate about it, uh, don't let that put you off. If you think this is for you, or you've got the heart for it, uh, then go for it. But I think wherever you end up, uh, I think it's well worth um, understanding some of these public health concepts and how you can contribute uh, in whatever you are doing towards that uh, fairer, more equal and healthier world. And I put a link down there, all our health. Uh, and it may be that you're, you know, not yet embarked on your career, not quite sure what to do, uh, then this is a learning resource that you can uh, kind of dip into. Uh, you have to register, but it's uh, completely free and you can go in there. There's all sorts of modules on, um, you know, uh, how you go around supporting somebody to stop smoking. There are things in there on climate change and our kind of role in that. So all sorts of things, safeguarding, some really important concepts that uh, it's important that everybody knows about. So that's, that's well worth having a look about. If you're thinking about um, getting into one of these professions, uh, it's good to go and explore that so you become familiar with some of the concepts and some of the ideas that would go down very well at interview. I would suggest if you can demonstrate that you've done some of that uh, prior learning. Uh, if you're in training at the minute uh, and kind of exploring what sort of future career you might want, then again, just having a look around there and seeing what uh, catches your eye and what uh, interests you there. Uh, if you're already uh, in a, a profession, but just want to kind of broaden your uh, thinking and, uh, and competence around some of these uh, issues, then there will be things in there for you. So I, I do uh, highly commend that to you. So uh, yes, that was uh, all I was going to say. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me today and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. I hope you can hear me uh, where you are. Uh, that was an absolutely fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for uh, such a personal account of your own experiences and also that really great overview of the role of public health in modern times. I'm sure many people at home who may have just heard about public health during COVID but didn't really understand the role that it played in the, the true span of uh, community that it covers may now have a better understanding and as well talking about your global experiences as well uh, to show as you mentioned that there is really just one health. Um, so a question you know, that we've got for you, for you here Andrew is there is a cost of living crisis coming up in the, in the near future what role does public health play in that? Yeah a, a, a huge role actually and uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with our directors of public health in the northwest uh, on this at the minute. Uh, so it, it's uh, a number of levels. Uh, yeah, so uh, understanding the data uh, and the intelligence on this, so some of our analysts have been looking at uh, the housing stock in the Northwest and which um, uh, households might be more vulnerable uh, to the uh, fuel cost increases that we're uh, seeing at the minute, how that then correlates with uh, what we know about people's income uh, what we know about poor health in these communities. So using that uh, intelligence and that data uh, to enable then local services to be able to target communities uh, with support and with uh, help. Uh, I've got somebody at the minute doing a bit of work around uh, food insecurity. Again, just trying to understand what is the evidence base about uh, how we can uh, support people that uh, might be struggling to find the money that they need to uh, eat well uh, during the winter and also to do that uh, in a culturally uh, appropriate way uh, just kind of understanding uh, the, the kind of um, food requirements of, of different populations within the northwest so again I'm kind of just thinking about that kind of from an inequalities uh, angle as well uh, working with our colleagues in the NHS around uh, what what this uh, cost of uh, living emergency might uh, uh, have implications for them in terms of uh, their own staff and their own workforce, uh, but also, uh, and most importantly, the people that they're uh, supporting and caring from for, uh, you know, how can uh, they better understand how to signpost people to uh, other sources of help that's, uh, that's out there. So an awful lot of work going on at the minute, yeah, it's around uh, planning for winter, which we do every year, uh, but this year particularly focusing on uh, the cost of living emergency. Thank you for that answer, uh, Andrew. Truly uh, covering a wide breadth again, you know, there is 
definitely always a lot going on in public health. And that leads me uh, well on to my next question. Um, with so much involved in public health, uh, sometimes it may be a bit overwhelming for people who are looking into it, getting involved in public health. To the young people watching today who want to get, gain some experience or find out more about public health, what's uh, one small tip that you might give them um, if they're hearing you talk about you know, this, uh, so, uh, how much public health is doing? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the uh, great things about public health, the breadth of it, but it's also uh, the downfall uh, in, in that sometimes it's, uh, it, it can be difficult to prioritize what we do to uh, the most important thing. But I think if you're a young person, just pick an issue that you feel uh, excited about and, and passionate about. It might be climate change. It might be uh, global health. It might be um, you know, the health of, uh, of young people. It, it might be uh, something around mental health. Um, just, just pick one thing that you feel uh, passionate about and uh, just do some exploring on the internet to find out a bit more about it. Uh, consider you know, volunteering for, for a, a group within your, your own community that's perhaps uh, doing some work on this. Uh, people are always looking for um, support and for um, for help on these issues. So I would just, uh, that would be my top tip, uh, just to uh, find one thing. I think the other thing I just kind of mentioned, uh, Yaz, is, is the importance um, of, of having a mentor. Uh, and certainly during my career, when I was at medical school, there was a professor of pediatrics who I kind of somehow latched onto, and uh, he was very kind in just kind of advising me from time to time when I was kind of struggling a bit and needing to know what to do next. And when I was just kind of reflecting back as I was preparing for this uh, talk, uh, I was just thinking uh, how I've benefited at different stages from different mentors, people that have kind of helped me and guided me along the way. So if you're a young person thinking about setting off on this journey and you can hook up with a local group and find somebody that's you know, prepared to mentor you a bit or just kind of guide you on that journey, uh, I think you'd find that really helpful too.